this is an update on the uh, Michael Slager case, and I'm going to play uh, the section from uh, the Roland Martin show this morning, and then I'm going to uh, play an interaction on uh, Stephanie Wolves' uh, show on MSNBC. And I want you to uh, notice the difference in the uh, conversations and the uh, level of emotion within the conversations. And then I'm going to make a comment as to my opinion why. And what, what's going on? I understand why, why you're doing all this. Why you All right, that's uh, one part of it. Hold on. Was arrested in charge. It shows no physical fight uh, that Slager had with Scott, but he says they indeed battle over his taser. Mr. Scott grabs the taser with his hand and starts yanking on it. And then he grabs it with his other hand and yanks on it with both hands. And then he bursts it out of my hand. Did he ever give you any justification of compliance or surrender? So now this is my question, and then I'm going to play the rest of this segment and then the uh, the other segment that I want to add to it. Let's say that uh, Mr. Slager is lying, is not lying, I'm sorry, he's telling the truth. I think he's lying, a lot of people think he's lying, but let's, let's just say that 1% that he's telling the truth about a struggle over the taser. And let's say because of the struggle over the taser, not his gun, but the taser, that he felt in fear for his life. Let's, let's give him that at the moment that they're struggling over the taser. And let's also give him the fact that Mr. Scott was able to get the taser away from him so that Mr. Scott had full control of the taser. My question is, how did Mr. Scott, from the moment that we see that video, no longer be in possession of the taser? Because it's the taser that apparently put this officer in fear for his life. So somehow, the taser goes from being under the control of Mr. Scott to being outside of the control of Mr. Scott. Okay, now, here's my uh, next question. How long are you justified in being in fear for your life? Is it a continuous fear once the fear first sets in? Does time and distance allow for that fear to be no longer justified? So again, my question is how long are you justified in being in fear for your life once Mr. Scott was no longer in possession of the taser and was putting distance between himself and you with no weapons, which you know he has no weapons, and he has his back turned to you. Are you still justified in being in fear for your life? Now, Slager's trial continues this morning. He faces 30 years to life if convicted. And so we will, of course, uh, keep up to date uh, on that court case as well. Now to Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, in, Sl in Slager's case, again, one of the rare times a police officer is actually charged 
uh, with killing someone. He was charged with murder. Typically in these cases, it's manslaughter. That's right. Uh, and so, uh, and, I, and, I, and I watched, I was on my radio show yesterday and I played the actual testimony. Prosecutors were boring in on him in terms of changing his story, remembering things later that he did not state that was fresh on his mind when it actually took place. So oh, you saw, you saw his eyes as he was testifying, looking down as if trying to remember, as, as if someone had been coached. But yeah, overcharging has been a problem consistently. But in both cases, in both these cases, South Carolina and in the case of what's both South Carolina cases, humanization is important. What do I mean? What was his intent? What did he fear for his life? This kind of thing. But when you're a white person who can express that, you might you're looking for a sympathetic juror. Same thing with Dylan Roof. He's got a legal team assisting him. Why is he defending himself? It might be in part to humanize himself. So what you have in both those cases is, is where in one case somebody might get a little leeway because they feared for something, even though their testimony may not always match. And in the other case, maybe we'll spare this guy de a death penalty because he's a kid. One thing that was quite interesting in the case of, um, of Slager, prosecutor kept hitting him over and over and over on Dill's traffic stop. Right. right. Traffic stop. Right. He said Escalated. that's all it was. I mean, he literally he kept hitting him on that point. Right. So definitely inconsistencies. The videotape shows the inconsistency. The overcharging issue, though, is a problem because well, murder requires a high, this intent uh, here, this premeditated. Uh, manslaughter can be more heat of the passion, heat of passion type of thing. But even in those so, cases, cops get off. No, they do. Sure. They do. They do. Sure. They do. So what's the strategy then? I mean, you see the criticism of Marilyn Mosby. The criticism, do, you, do you just throw everything against the wall and hope that the jury picks something that sticks? So like Spencer says, do you just go for the more reasonable charge? So same thing in Tulsa shooting. Uh, bottom line there is we see this video. If we see this guy. All right. So that's uh, basically uh, their comments regarding the Slager case. Now I'm going to jump to the Slager case, but uh, between a defense attorney and um, a, another prosecutor. Now, the difference here is you notice in this conversation, it wasn't anywhere near being heated. What's the difference in this next uh, interaction? Now, here's a clip from Stephanie Rule's uh, show. Um, and the difference is you have a black woman uh, on one side of the panel and a white man on the other and now automatically uh, things get uh, a little warm and the specific uh, issue of race is injected into this now when uh, the opening for this particular piece played or the run up to it Stephanie Rule said, uh, we're getting ready to discuss a case where a black man was shot by a white police officer. Well, hell, race is automatically injected as soon as you say that. So it, it, it's not so much that the, the uh, black attorney uh, injected it. it. It's already there. Race is automatically assumed in a lot of these situations. And when you put a black person and a white person into a conversation, race is most of the time dead in the middle of it. Okay, and I really and you could pick pretty much any subject that you want. Okay, here go here comes the clip. Police officer charged in the death of an unarmed black man is taking the stand in his own defense. 35-year-old Michael Slager is accused of killing Walter Scott following a routine traffic stop in April of 2015. Cell phone video of the incident appears to show Slager shooting Scott as he ran away. Joining me now, radio host and attorney Mo Ivory and retired New Jersey police lieutenant Stephen Rogers. Welcome to you both. I want to start by playing some of Officer Slager's testimony and get your reaction first. Slager said it didn't make any sense to him why Scott ran. Take a look. In my mind at that time, people don't run from a broken kill plan. There's always another reason. Mo, let's start with you. There's always another reason. Why would he run? 
Well, I mean, you know, we don't know what that reason was. And, you know, we found out later that he was concerned about a child support warrant that might have been out for him. But that is not a reason alone to decide that somebody is running and that they pose a deadly threat to you. So, I mean, I, I think that that was the first place where this whole uh, murder went wrong. Um, at that moment, he could have easily decided that when uh, Walter Scott was running, call backup and wait for backup. But no, he made the decision to go after Walter Scott. So in his mind, he had already created a scenario that Walter Scott was a dangerous black man that he needed to go after. Stephen, what's your reaction? To begin with, Mo is partially right. Uh, uh, again, race does not have to come into this situation. When she says the officer uh, concluded he was a dangerous, <coughs> excuse me, black man, that is wrong. Police officers, believe it or not, when they do their job and they're looking out to protect themselves and others, are not necessarily looking at race. But let that is not true. That is absolutely not true. Uh, we know for a fact that anytime there is a black person, man, woman, or child, Police perceive black people as being more of a threat to them than white people. Absolutely not true what this guy just said. So for him to say that the fact that this black guy, uh, his race wasn't a factor in the shooting is absolutely untrue. Because, and I honestly believe if that had been a white guy running away, that guy wouldn't have been shot. But that's my own opinion. Okay, let's keep going. Let me share this with you. I viewed that tape over and over and over again. And in my view, there's absolutely no justification for that officer shooting this individual. None whatsoever. He made a stop of a broken taillight. He said that the, he, he, there was a reason why the man ran. Well, what if the man was mentally ill? What if the man was just in fearful of the police? You don't go shooting people uh, that run away from you unless, Stephanie, they're armed or are a threat to the officer or someone else. Okay, well, Slager did say in testimony, he said that he fired fired his taser at Scott three times, and while he was trying to subdue him to the ground, Scott wrestled the taser away and pointed it at him. Take a look. You see that barrel, like this big, coming at me. And I knew I was in trouble. At that time, I, I pulled my firearm, and I pulled the trigger. I fired until the threat was stopped. Okay, now again, but see now none of that washes he said this because you'll see that in the video. None of that washes because there is too much time in between uh, that uh, barrel of that taser being pointed at him, and we never do hear, and maybe it's just uh, missing that uh, somehow he got that taser away from him. But from the point that we see the video starting. The man basically turns around, has his back to him, and is running away. Running away with no weapon in hand is not a threat. So again, I'm asking the question, how long are you able to use the fact that you felt that your life was in danger uh, from the quote unquote fictitious struggle uh, with a taser being pointed at you from that point to you getting, obviously, the taser away from him, how long are you allowed to feel that uh, you your life is in danger? In the video that we see, uh, Scott is running away. But the fact that he said he fears for his life, Stephen, does that justify anything? Look, we could say that. Maybe he did. I don't know. I, I, look, it's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback. But I, I could tell you, unless your life is in imminent danger, and I don't see it here, uh, you're not going to use deadly force. Uh, and that officer's going to have to prove that he felt his life was in danger. But what we see on that video is would be troubling to any professional law enforcement officer. Mo, when the officer says he felt like he was in total danger, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, that's why it's hard when I hear Steven say that, like, why are you bringing race into it or why would you dismiss it? Because that, you know, to say that I thought my life was in danger just because this man who was unarmed was running away from me, you know, begs you to ask more questions. None of the evidence that has been presented in the case says that there was uh, an eminent danger for the officer, that he was even tased, but no. that the taser was even in Walter Scott's hands. Since that we has don't. not been proven. Then since we don't know why is it fair to assume that it was race 
because that's the only other factor involved in this. If it was a white on white guy, in my opinion, that officer would not have shot him in the back. But because it was a black guy, okay, he felt a higher quote unquote sense of fear. And that is what kicked him over to make the decision to pull the trigger. Now, if you can arrive at a different uh, uh, hypothesis regarding uh, why this man was shot, please let me know. No, it's not fair to assume that it's right. It's fair to go on the actions and the video and the evidence that is there. And so to say that, dismiss all of that, and let's just say, what, let's just go on what the officer was feeling. There's no evidence yeah. besides what the officer Mom, said. Mom, There's here's, nothing here's the to problem, support Mom. that Mom, at all. Mom, no, it, with let's all be really respect. honest about Mom, it. Let's be due, really honest about it. This isn't a monologue. This is supposed to be a dialogue. Okay, okay, sure. Steven. Mo, with all due respect, every time... You or anyone else on the air brings up race for every single incident a police officer is involved in. It is a disservice, a disservice to, to, to what the black community is trying to do and the police are trying to do to bring us together. We have to start uniting people. And you know how you unite them? You look at the facts. And the facts on that tape do not lead us to believe that race had anything to do with this. Right, Stephen, let me tell you one thing real quick about uniting people. Uniting people starts with telling the truth, okay? Uniting people starts with having an open conversation about about what is really happening in our country, in our cities, and in so our why did you bring race So into please this? do not act like race is not a factor in so many right, of these police shootings and should not be discussed. <laughs> okay, to, to the two of you, here's the positive. We are going See, and that's what happens when race gets injected into any conversation, especially when it's between a black person and a white person, the situation almost always gets heated because the treatment of blacks becomes a highly emotional uh, situation and uh, for black people. And the treatments of blacks by white people becomes a defensive position. You don't necessarily uh, become emotional when you're on defense. It's basically, you know, back up, and try to defend. That's not a really an emotional response. But when you feel threatened, okay, and your people feel threatened, okay, that is when uh, the adrenaline starts rising and when uh, you start uh, shutting down and locking in on your point of view. So I was just, I'm just saying that to, to show you the difference uh, when the same case is being discussed on one hand, uh, by uh, black people solely, and I call the Asian lady, you know, she, I throw her in there, but she didn't really say much anything anyway. And a black educated woman and a white educated guy. There is a big difference. And until we can calm down and talk about the situation at the same emotional levels, things are not going to get better. Now, Bottom line, Slager's guilty as hell. He needs to be convicted. I don't know if they overcharged him or not, but he better get convicted of something because there is no way in the world that a police officer stops a guy for a broken taillight. The guy has no weapons in the car, gets out, tries to run away. And if you call that running, um, I mean, that police officer must have been in piss poor shape because that guy didn't look like he could run, uh, you know, 20 yards, okay? So the officer just decided he wasn't going to chase this guy and he was just going to shoot him. That's basically bottom line, end of story.